Guru Nation, what is up with you guys and gals? Welcome back. Thank you so much. This is going to be, I already know this is going to be a classic interview. Okay. Uh, we got Ashley Margo. She's a remote site monitor. She's exactly, she's been through exactly this process of what we're talking about as far as interview questions and clinical research. And this is not the only question I got. I get this question like a lot, like every week, if not every day when the market's hot. Okay, so let me just read it. And then if you guys don't know, Ashley Margo, she's a remote site monitor. She's got the AM senior. approach, senior remote site monitor. Who knows? It's hard to keep up with all these titles, but she's <laughs> she's got the AM approach, which is probably more important than anything because she's able to help clients out she does coaching for linkedin for resume for interview preps all kind of stuff why don't you tell them what what you do first let's get that plug out of the way this is sponsored by ashley margo for sure thanks dan uh yeah so the founder of uh creator of the am approach and i like dan just said i assist um individuals that are uh, research naive that are jumping in typically uh more popularly it's those clin clinicians, clinical industry background and a uh, life science background. Uh, but I do take all sorts of backgrounds because I feel like the concepts that I teach are kind of universal, um, that those are trying to get into the industry um, and also those that are already in the industry that are trying to level up, right? So I, I really, is, I take a full, you know, a 180 look into their documentation. I get a little bit on the backstory, um, you know, and kind of figure out the, the, the little holes that might be there. And I help assist kind of fill them in and, and better approach the job applicant uh, applications and interviews like that okay good thank you for that so link her linkedin profile is underneath the video and if you're listening on the podcast this is going to go on the podcast it's too good not to it's in the show notes click it it's the first <laughs> link you'll see actually margo you need to connect with her even if you don't need her coaching just go connect okay hey dan hope you're doing well i got an interview at icon for a couple of posts Startup associate and site management associate. I think both are quite similar uh, to an in-house CRA. You are right. You are right. And Ashley's going to tell us more about whether you're right or not. I haven't had an interview for about 10 years and want to prepare well. Can you offer advice about the types of questions that I might be asked? Or do you know of any websites that I might have this info available? So that's the question. What do you think, Ashley? Have at it, Ashley. <laughs> we've got 30 20 30 minutes for sure for sure uh yeah so there are you know um as far as websites are concerned that i use and and i guess this also just depends on how, how well you feel about those questions but um one place to go to is create an, a link on um, an account on glassdoor.com and there's a, a way that you can sort through company through position and then through reviews, which offer the questions. Um, those though can be super old questions. Some, some might be new. And then also just remember, um, like I do try to tell my clients that uh, when you do mock trial interviews, a lot of times the questions will be tailored to your background, right? Um, they do review your resume. I mean, there are some that I'm going to speak about right now that are pretty much general that I honestly have been seeing for the years that I've been, you know, going through different industries, uh, the clinical industry, life science industry, and now into research um, that are pretty much repetitive. And I feel for good reason they're repetitive, but um, as far as the more particular ones, I feel that they tailor them according to your background, right? Because they want to, if they're not getting enough information from your resume um, or from your LinkedIn in this case, uh, they're going to try to ask you questions to get information that they're not already receiving from your documents. Right. So that's just something to, to be aware of. And for an example of that, let's say that um, on your LinkedIn, um, you have, you know, slightly less documentation than you have on your resume and on your resume for the same position. Let's say that you were clinical data specialist in the background. Right. Um, in your resume, you put that, you know, you oversee documentation. You would communicate with different, let's say, um, doctor's offices on this lab uh, lab reports and things like that but you're not really talking in depth about what systems are you using are your pro are you using protocols when you're dealing with that data information um, are you dealing with any types of protocols when you're dealing with let's say um, say lab records that are you know um, abnormal right is there a particular way that you go about things right because you can also link those to maybe how you would handle an AE I mean there's so many different ways to look and how you can kind of showcase 
and correlate your current or previous job experience to that in research. And I find that that's like one of the biggest issues because most individuals either um, are trying to jump in or have been maybe a clinical research coordinator for a long time and they don't really know how to correlate their position specific to how that would benefit the next position up that they're trying to get into. Or in this case, those that are research naive and how they're trying to transition. Like for instance, if you're a previous accountant or a professor, um, even one in one case scenario, a dance teacher, um, you know, there's different ways you can do this. It's just, a, I think I feel it's like word verbiage and how you can articulate it and the skill sets that you bring, right? And how you can correlate it to your the position you're trying to apply for. Okay, so for the rest of this interview, let's talk about like possible maybe scenario questions mm -hmm. that they're going to ask. And this is not just for startup specialists, but all these similar kind of positions like startup specialist, remote site monitor, in-house CRA, clinical trial assistant. They're kind of all like in the same category, right? Every company, it's confusing because every company calls it something else. I don't know why, but they all do. So there's two people, right? There's two type, there's two archetypes for the people watching this, people with experience in research and people without, mm -hmm. because you can say these are entry level jobs, no? I mean, yeah, in a, in a sense, I mean, in-house CRA, um, I would say yes, because now we're in such a huge demand that I feel that the CROs and sponsors are starting to understand that they kind of maybe not somewhat maxed out the CRAs that have experience and they need to start, you know, uh, getting individuals that are either CRCs from sites or, you know, those that are, you know, no research experience, but that, that somehow they have some background like clinicians, right? That's why you're seeing a lot of these, um, I would say, uh, positions that are coming up, like intro uh, transition to CRA positions, right? Stuff like that, because they're trying to art, like adjust their trainings for those that have no experience. And I feel that that's why. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. um okay so for these two archetypes the research naive and the maybe a coordinator or somebody who wants to just transition to a CRO or a sponsor it makes sense to if you can't do CRA right away typically what they look at if they watch these videos is these worlds right and that's what you did also by the way mm -hmm. you want to do like two minutes of your story yeah. Just to make you uh, relatable, because right now, Ashley, to the inexperienced, you're so like far ahead from where mm -hmm. they are, they can't relate, but it hasn't been that long. No, no, it hasn't. Um, so I had, I've been working since I was 19. I have eight years in the, in the clinical industry, and uh, I initially just started off as secretary, receptionist in a, host, in a home health, uh, started to maneuver up through the positions, through quality assurance, and physical therapy, um, documentation reviewer, and things like that, data entry. And then from there, I ended up uh, becoming a um, medical transcriptionist, right? I got a little certification. This is why I highly recommend the CRC Theory Academy. Certifications are seriously underrated. This is the way, easier, quicker way, more even cheaper way compared to school to jump up, maneuver, get you know more experience and exposure, because that's really the best way to do it. From there, I became... Um, a clinical data specialist and uh, in public health for the state of Texas. And then from there, I maneuvered into uh, research, right? And all that recently just happened, I believe 2000, uh, 20, 2019, 2018, uh, somewhere around there that it just happened. I've only been with the CRO uh, going on about to be two years. Two years. Um, and that's like yeah. the magic number too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for so, anything or anything yeah with experience <laughs> and all that yeah and, I, and I've maneuvered up really really fast um and honestly the tactics that I've used um coming into the research industry and maneuvering through the research industry is the exact same thing that I used in the clinical industry this can this is that's why I say it's very universal it's just a matter of understanding your background what you're going to showcase for your background and also how you're wording it because you can I can tell my clients, you can look super great. You can pay for a resume writer and, you know, really spruce up all your documentation mm -hmm. and your LinkedIn and all that good stuff. But once you're in the interview, if you are not replicating what the documentation shows verbally, right, um, it's just not going to equate. You know, it's an easy way to kind of just turn somebody off to how you present, right? And so, um, yeah, that's, you know, that's kind of my story. I'm here now. I'm 
uh, <laughs> Latinos in Clinical Research. The now you're approach. teaching others how to do it. That's yeah. basically, we need more people like you in the space too. So, okay, mm -hmm. let's get to the questions because mm -hmm. they know beforehand, we cannot treat the research naive the same as those with experience. Mm -hmm. If on your resume, you, they know you don't have experience, the questions they ask you for the same job are going to be different than the questions they ask somebody who they know have experience. If you're well, lying on your resume, shut down your computer and go to sleep because this yeah. is not for you. Yeah. Go do something else. But okay, let's do first research naive. What kind of okay. questions would they ask and maybe give like three or four examples? For sure. Uh, so real quick, so you understand the process. So um, this may have changed because now we're they're trying to hire much quicker now. But when I initially started, there was about three processes. One is you would get a recruit and screen, recruitment screening call, pretty much just the recruiter making sure that you're the right fit and that you have the same expectations that the, the, the job, the company is wanting to make sure, right? So that, that'll come down to possibly sometimes talking about your expected pay, the kind of position and your background and if it equates, right? Um, so those questions, you don't really have to worry about them too much as long as you've read the job description and you know, you know you're in the right space and that's fine. Um, but the second one would be talent acquisition specialist. So this is the person um, that will pretty much interview you, right? And this is again, CRO perspective. They'll be interviewing you and then just kind of going through the basic questions, which is usually tell me about yourself. Um, tell me about a time where you had to incorporate teamwork, right? Things like that. I mean, very general. They, they will be di worded differently, but again, just an example of teamwork, making sure that you know how to communicate and understand people uh, without you know causing confrontation or anything like that. Um, another question, the most common one, what is your greatest strength and weakness? And I feel that's common because most people do not answer that question, those questions accurately. What's and your also, answer? What's uh, your my answer? answer? Sorry to interrupt, but I have to get this because I know they always ask that. So mm -hmm. what so, did you say? So my greatest strength is organization, right? Uh, it's um, Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Someone that knows actually this for sure. Yeah, my greatest strength is organization. Um, I really, I'm heavily organized to the point where, you know, it replicated throughout the years. So like I obviously go into depth about my past and how I've, you know, matured through that particular skill set and how I want to now take that into an industry in this particular industry and advance it, right? And this is why at the time, the company that I was applying for was not only known for their time management, uh, but they were also known for their high level of um, teaching, right? Which again, advances you and your organization and things like that. So of course I intertwined those things with myself and the answer. And that's kind of how you correlate a really, really good answer. Um, and so that was my strength. The organization aspect was my strength. And I just kind of focused in on that. Uh, my weakness was that I tend to, because I'm very organized, I tend to over... Um, What's sorry? What's the way to put it? I uh, I say yes to a lot of things, and I'm assuming that through organization I can maintain all those things. But you know, um, I explained how I took steps to kind of make sure that I double checked myself in my prior prioritization, and how if I was actually able to follow through with that, um, you know, um, you know saying that I would be able to do it. So, mm. you know, I give an example and all of those kinds of things like that. Examples are everything in the So question, you give right? example, but you follow everything. up your answer with I'll, in this always. particular situation. Yes. And you're not making so, this up, right? No, 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 no. You no, did it no, like no. from real, real experiences. But yeah, all from real, real experience. I mean, again, there's like people I said, watching this, they're saying, well, I don't have any. So like, I want one to make up. I'll just still oh, ask so, you. yeah, don't do that. No, because I mean, not... again, um, this is why I tell, you know, my clients when you're interviewing, don't think there's no right or wrong answer when it comes to examples. It's mm -hmm. your life. It's how you experienced it, how you learned. And that's super important because those particular perspectives is very unique, mm. right? So the hiring manager or the talent acquisition specialist is going to pick up on how, what type of learner you are. And are you a type of learner based off every answer that is willing to acknowledge your mistakes? Mm. And that's super important because in research, especially like where I work, um, you know, they don't, they don't micromanage. They, you know, you are at that high level that you should know what you're supposed to do. And they expect you to, you know, follow through with what you need. And if not to come clean with what your mistakes were and how we so, could fix them, you know. So be honest, even if you think your weakness is something bad that they won't like. What if oh, your weakness yeah. is like, you're lazy? 
Uh, well, yeah, I mean, we'll then talk about how you're working on that, right? I mean, obviously, okay. the thing is, even if you're lazy, um, it's like you may have all these negative aspects. We all do. We're human, right? But they wouldn't be interviewing you if you weren't a very qualified candidate, right? Okay. So you, a lot of those things that I talk, I teach on that, on the nervousness. I kind of work with my clients on mm. what their biggest fears are. Because usually you have to focus on what makes you nervous about the interview first mm -hmm. and create the, log uh, the logical reason as to why you should not be. In this case, you shouldn't be nervous on the answers you give because you are already a qualified candidate. You have, you know, statistically already beaten out multiple applicants just by being in, in the interview, right? So you should already know that you are technically wanted. They just need to vet you out and see if you're the best candidate, right? You know, All so... Right. Yeah, so but just always be truthful. Yeah, always be truthful. Um, and then when you're answering your question, you want to do the STAR method, right? You always want to do the whole, you know, situation, task, action, result, and then follow up as to maybe what you're doing to to adjust, right? The the end result if it wasn't a positive end result, right? I mean, you always want to show that you're willing to learn and you're adapting so, to the learning curve. So then you almost have less to worry about. Uh, as somebody who's research naive that they know you're research naive because it's just these kind of questions really and more like what you did in your last job that they think might translate into your new job so there's nothing you have to learn necessarily no 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 not really so like in um so when you're comparing the two from research naive to research experience usually uh they will kind of give you maybe one or two of the basic questions and then they'll, they'll jump into seeing how adept you are to the, the depth of your knowledge in the industry, right? So they're going to hit you with some of those questions like describe an AE, tell me about, you know, the protocol and how you go about doing the ICH and things like ICF with the patient consent forms. I mean, they're going to want to dig to see how far and at what level you are. Um, and then usually in those cases, obviously use those examples. And then you all, I, I tell my clients more important in that aspect to really focus on how you um how your particular tactic and the strengths behind how you address certain things how they correlate with the company and their overall you know focus as a company because each company you know yes they want to do research and all that but they tend to all have their own little focus if you if you do enough research right and so um kind of directing in that way showing them that yes you know i'm a cra i'm experienced rsm or however um but particularly, I've had my experience and through my research, I know that I fit well with your culture, right? That's kind of how you start, you know, removing you as a, like visually as a candidate and start relating you to them as a team member, right? Mm -hmm. um, so again, it's when you're doing, you know, with me, mock trial interviews, I tailor very particularly to your background and where you are in, in your industry. With so those the coaching that are is really like, personalized because it's like you yeah. take their background and you say okay well this is what they're going to ask you but this video is like meant to be like kind of an appetizer like a hey, generous yeah in a macro level this is the yeah. case all right yeah. so research naive enough with that because there's not much really we can do mm -hmm. uh, other than just be honest with yourself mm -hmm. uh, now it gets interesting right the people that have like six to 12 months of experience which are, by the way, like all of our interns from all yeah. of our academies. I got to give a plug. CRA, CRC Academy, Ashley actually takes care of the resumes for you in that and does guest lectures too. All the way through. Yeah, she's okay. everywhere, guys. She's giving back to the community. So let's go to the people with six to 12 months of experience or even more. Maybe somebody's watching that wants to be a CTM, although that's really outside the scope of this. But let's focus on like six to 12 months experience. Mm -hmm. It's where it gets hard. Because not every company gives the person the same level of duties and responsibilities. So that may be good at the time, like, oh, I only did this, this, and this. But now you're working, you're going to go work for another company where they're interviewing you. And you're like, oh, well, I didn't do like 20% of the things that this guy did at this other site. Mm -hmm. So this, there's a variability here. And yeah. For the jobs you applied for, like specifically these positions at CROs, all right, in-house, startup, TMF assistant, whatever they call them, the mm -hmm. remote site monitor, like that you became, what do they ask? Where can they so, go? Oh, oh, uh, like as far as questions and stuff? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it questions really, I think they're all generalized. Like I said, I feel like it really just comes down to 
when your resume, what you're showing on your resume, if you're not giving enough in depth, then they're going to drill for more in depth. So mm -hmm. I would say there's two approaches, right? If you don't have in-depth information on your resume, but you were in interesting enough that they wanted to pick you up for an interview, they're going to drill you for more questions in regards to what your background was. Typically, they'll say, did you do any, uh, aside from what you listed, was there any additional work that you did? Did you work alongside, you know, say another CRA? Have you, have you uh, shadowed anybody? Do you have a full idea of what this job entails and have you done it, right? Um, and then the other the other aspect is more uh, in the questions. If you're not providing more information outside of what's listed on the resume, which most people do this, right? Because they have their resume up and, <clears throat> excuse me, and they're listing, talking about what's already on the resume. They already know that. They've read it. They've reviewed it, especially when you come to the hiring manager. It's like the last part of the interview. You know, you need to give more. You need to give a lot more detail and and again, articulate the answers, right? So in the questions, again, the more basic ones, tell me about yourself, degree of strength and weakness, those are general, right? The tell me about yourself really uh, goes in depth to, to you as a person in the background. This is where you really should be highlighting everything you've learned in each, well, not everything you learned, but like the most prominent aspects that you've learned in each job. And again, you know, somehow linking yourself to that and your growth to that now to this next big step, right? Mm. Um, but when it comes specifically to other questions, I feel like these are kind of the more the basic, like I said, um, give me a little bit of background in the, you know, give me the difference between an SAE and AE. Uh, tell me about a scenario that when you've had to work with the PI, right? Um, was there any conflicting issues? How did you uh, communicate to the PI that there was an issue or there was some sort of, um, uh, let's say, findings that that was you know, inaccurate documentation, something that would probably catch the PI off guard, right? Something like that. Um, they're going to ask you those kinds of details, right? So if somebody, let's say, let's say a student, right, uh, was in the internship and all they did was maybe virtual documentation and every now and then they spoke with the CRA and maybe the site coordinator, but they really didn't deal with the PI as much, right? So a rule of thumb in the interview is you want to really try to keep the focus on all the great things, on the highlighted stuff, right? You want to take the focus off of not so much that it's negative, but the fact that you don't have experience in certain areas, right? So if they were asked you a question, for example, oh, have you ever worked with the PI? And you, you could say, uh, no, I've never worked with a PI before. I mean, that's a typical answer, right? But, or you could say, um, you know, currently as, a, as of right now, uh, given that I have reminding them like a year's worth of experience, uh, I'm still under... Uh, under view with the CRA. However, I uh, work alongside and collaborate with the CRA to work with higher management, right? Higher management can mean a lot of things, but nonetheless, it shows that you still have adaptability to the higher level, right? Higher management and working out any findings or any issues that are, you know, uh, happening with the sites and making sure that we do X, Y, Z. So you shift the view to one negative to all the positive, and then you give them an example about the steps you've taken and all of that. So you're just really shifting. It's word verbiage and keeping control of the answer, right? And like, again, I just feel like most individuals, it's just coming in nervous. And then, you know, especially when it comes to a question that they know they don't have an answer for, mm -hmm. right? For instance, like that one, they kind of lock up and give a very quick, short response. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and it kind of is like, oh, okay, well, they don't have, let me take that off. Like they'll say, no, I haven't had experience with a yeah. PI, with, which is our CRA Academy interns as an example, but, or mm -hmm. the same CRA Academy intern as an example can say, indirectly I did because, mm -hmm. and then you talk about the reports you did and how it funnels up to your CRA and mm -hmm. like you said, upper management and that gets translated, communicate to the PI. Exactly. Because really what I, the question that they're trying to get at is, because even like, for instance, me, I rarely speak with the PI, mm -hmm. even though most of my stuff has to deal with a lot of PI documentation and all of that. They just want to know that you can communicate with different levels, right? Because when you're in research, especially the CRO perspective, you are not only dealing with maybe sometimes, you know, medical assistants, lab techs, but you're dealing with the site co coordinator, or sometimes the nurses are the site coordinators, PAs, NPs, all different levels and all different levels, especially if you have clinical background, you know that there's different, you know, attitudes, different, you know, uh, ways of communication, depending on what level you're at, especially if they have a very busy site. And so sometimes when you come in asking for something that other studies are also asking for, it can put the PI or, you know, the higher management in a situation that gets them 
uh, not as happy, right? And so you kind of jump into those scenarios where it's uncomfortable and they want to know that you know how to communicate well and, and still be able to have that dialogue, right? Because whether you're an in-house CRA or not, you know, if you want to be a CRA later, right, you need to be able to have that relationship going and mm. communication is almost like the biggest foundation, I think. Were you ever like just peppered with questions like nonstop? I think the more senior level you try to go, yeah, you, they just don't stop. Like I remember when I was contract CRA, I would interview with different biotechs when they needed a CRA. Yeah. And they would, it was like nonstop. There was like two people, each was a manager and they would just grill me. Like, what do you do when there's a temperature excursion? And then I answered. And then like the next guy wouldn't even wait or give any feedback, ask the next question, the next and the next and the next until they decided it was enough. Yeah. And then after I mean, that, I'm left like, whoa, like well, <laughs> you know, it's a lot. It's, well, that tactic right there is pretty much them trying to see how well you do under pressure and how mm. how fast your knowledge is. Because if I would assume at this point as a senior CRA, right, the pay level is at a whole different level mm -hmm. um, and your exposure and also responsibility, right? At this point, mm. you're going to, you know, management's probably going to be completely hands off with you and expect mm. you to have full control in a sense. Um, so they need to make sure that not only can you handle pressure, but that your thought, thinking process process and also your ability to respond quickly is at a high as a super high pace and this again this is why I say that it's important that when you do go and get mock trial interviews from individuals it not be something that where they just sit with you and ask questions they actually see your documentation you talk to them about your background mm -hmm. they have a full view background of who you are and where you're coming from and where your goals are right because again in the interview they talk about that mm -hmm. um, and so there's just there's so many things that entail an interview and so many aspects that need to be considered um, and that's not even looking at you know if the person has like a speaking tick or if they have you know a nervous tick or anything like that right and so uh, because presentation is also everything specifically if you're going to be speaking with sites virtually or in person you know you have to be a good representative which is what you do right that's yes that's, that's your role mm -hmm. Um, okay, so that's good advice, actually. So at the more junior level position, they're not really asking you like that hardcore. They're not like interrogating you. I felt like it was being interrogated. Yeah. Um, so there, it's it's and it's less about memorizing questions because mm -hmm. I always tell people when they ask me this, it's impossible to prepare you for this with questions because there could be thousands of questions. So what if the ones we prepare, yeah. we can spend three hours, okay, and they may not ask mm -hmm. you any of the ones I asked you. Yes. During the interview. So the, what you're saying is the strategy is more important. Yes. What about taking yeah. control of the interview? Like, let's say you step in and you feel like, uh, I don't like the way this is headed, like what they're trying to start to ask me. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're starting to ask you about things you're shaking that are not with. Great. Yeah. So what about taking control and saying, well, and then just talking about things you have done. Is that a strategy? Yeah. So I will actually give you a good example that I experienced. Um, and it was very interesting. So. Um, I went through what you, with the interview that you kind of mentioned. Uh, this was for Medtronic. I, I mean, I'm not working for them, so I don't mind saying their name. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I was with Medtronic, and it was an intense. You guys lost a good one, Medtronic. <laughs> a three to four hour interview. It was insane. Wow. Yeah, and and I got I got grilled really heavily. And did I you get bathroom breaks or what? Mine did. Uh, no, no, no. They got <laughs> wow. like five. Well, I five minute break, but I was my adrenaline wow. was just so high. And I was fasting. I didn't know it was going to be that long. So it was brutal. It honestly was brutal. I had a headache afterwards. But anyway, wow. um, so once I finally got up to the manager, right, uh, yeah. the very, the, the general, literally general manager. Um, the boss. The boss, the head boss. Um, Bowser. He, <laughs> I was thinking that. <laughs> oh, my gosh. 90s, 80s. Anyway, um, so uh, he was asking me, uh, he, he touched on some of the questions that I had already been asked. And, but after those questions, he said, um, so tell me about uh, how you are as a learner, right? So I explained how I learn things, et cetera. And then he said, okay, um, so how do you feel about praise? And I was just like, wow, you know, I'd never been asked that question before. He wanted to know how I felt about being praised as a worker, or as a, you know, as a uh, personnel. And I said, well, I mean, I don't think anybody doesn't like praise unless you're extremely maybe introvert and it makes you uncomfortable. I was just like, but yeah, you know, if, if it's, if it's, if it's, your, if it's a job well done and, and it really helps the company, well, of course. He's like, well, can you tell me uh, of a time that you did something for a company? And I said, yeah. So 
I talk about I talked about this long process that I did, which ultimately just you know short summary. Um, I ended up helping the you know the um, the clinic, which was a, a hybrid clinic, both research and clinical. Um, I helped them. They were having massive turnover of MAs, which would stall the amount of patients getting pushed in, right? So I created this whole training process because you know I like making processes and making them simplistic. Um, and the turnover pretty much um, halted, and they ended up sa- uh, saving up to I think seventy percent of what they were previously making, uh, previously spending due to the turnover of training and all of that stuff. Um, and then on top of that, the patient uh, processing increased about like forty five percent. So I mean, I had a huge impact on on the the, the hybrid clinic. And um, and he's like, okay, he's like, did your manager give you a praise praise for that? And, you know, at the moment I realized, I was like, oh, actually they didn't, you know? And, mm-hmm. and I said, well, no, 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 they, they actually didn't. I mean, I, I, I knew what it did though. So I was happy because I knew what, you know, what the outcome was. He was like, okay. He's like, well, don't you think that's, you know, a bit unfair that your manager or whoever was, you know, didn't uh, give you praise. They're yeah. To and see, I, like what kind of person I, <laughs> yeah. And I said, I was just like, well, to be quite honest, um, you know, for one, you know, because I'm very appreciative of the experience that they gave me, um, I'm very appreciative of that experience. So uh, I definitely don't feel that there's anything uh, negative to be said about them. Uh, but secondly, I, I just, I do want to just say, though, I'm grateful that regardless of whether they gave me praise or not, that experience, that opportunity to make that change made me a better person and a better person within my industries. And now I'm here speaking to you telling you a really great story about how I grew mm. as a professional. And he stayed quiet for like maybe two seconds, three seconds. And he said, it's a very good answer. And I'm very happy you didn't talk bad about your. your ah, program. he's trying to get you. Yeah. And I laughed. Oh, I was just like, I was like, man, you know, that's, I was like, that's a good that's one. Sick. I've never asked that one before. He's just like, yeah, I like to sneak up on people because I want to know who we're bringing in our team. Okay. And yeah. So, but I'm just trying to get like, you know, I, he so asked they basically me want positive people. Well, not that it was just positive, but I think what it was is that they wanted to, they wanted to see if I was the kind of person that if I was not always getting what I wanted or something like that, you know, if I'm the kind of person that shifts with the tide or however you want to say. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, but nonetheless, the whole point of me telling the story was the strategy, right? Was that the fact that um, in that process, I saw where he was getting at, right? I, I had an option whether to talk about yeah, I didn't like that they didn't praise me, right? Because I did a lot for the company. But, or I could go the route of, you know, take the higher road and say, you know what? Yes, but that's not the point. The point yeah. is me. It's not the company. And we're here today because of me. And I'm just grateful that I learned, right? And so you so, could have been like, yeah, I could see myself in that situation. I would be like, well, I didn't really notice that till you mentioned it, but no. And I don't work that way because of them. I work that way because of me. Yeah. Something like that. And, Yeah. And so it's just shifting. Right. But uh, again, you know, being very, that's something you cannot practice. Right. You have to just know your background, know that this is what I'm coming with. I think everyone gets so caught up in wanting the job and wanting the job with that particular company that they're willing to do anything. And really what they forget is that you are not molding for the company. The company is, you know, trying to mold for you. This is why they do the screening call. Right. They want to see if you mesh with the company and it's for good reason, you know, and I know it's easier said than done because most of us. Culture. Do. Yeah. Culture. Yeah. And we, but you didn't easier. get that job. No, Maybe no, they I didn't wanted you to bash them. Oh, who knows? <laughs> who knows? But yeah, it was, uh, it was an interesting interview. And honestly, it was, uh, one of the best interviews, like overall that I've been through because he grilled me. He definitely grilled me pretty, pretty intense. And uh, it was a good learning experience. Oh, so I guess I know you got to go quickly, but, Okay, that's actually a good segue because mm-hmm. you didn't get that job, right? Yes. But you got another and yes. you didn't let that affect you. No. I think a lot of people, if they would have gone through that, let's say the recruiter, then someone else, and then Bowser comes along and you spend <laughs> four hours with him mm-hmm. and then you don't get it, you could feel like a little bit defeated, right? Like, ah, oh, yeah. what? I'm not doing this anymore. Or maybe yeah. I'm just not good enough. Mm-hmm. like did those thoughts go through your head uh no because well 
I'm, it, it comes down to the per, each person. And I also give kind of coaching on this. Um, you know, some people are extreme, just go-getters. You maybe not be super positive, but you just know what you bring. And I've always been super confident, even when I had little to no experience. Um, and I always bring that to the interview always. And, and I can say that with full confidence. Um, and not everybody's like that, right? You know, people are sometimes just more aware of their insecurities and that's also perfectly fine. Um, but when I did that, no, I just, I felt, especially with that question, the way I answered it and he said, Oh, like that was a good answer. I was like, okay, great. I left it knowing that, okay, I did great. Like if I don't get it, I mean, I don't get it. Right. So you did not get um, it because of that answer. <laughs> yeah, no. And it's, it's a pretty funny story. Um, I, the very first job I applied to ever coming out of college um, was Thermo Fisher. And uh, I applied mm. to so many of Thermo Fisher and it never happened. I never even got calls or anything. And I was like, okay, well, they're at a high level anyways. Maybe I was just, you know, fighting off too much that I could chew. And well, now I'm with them and it's just interesting, yeah. you know? Yeah. So it's just, you know. Through so acquisition. Through yeah, through acquisition. acquisition, through acquisition. Yes. But I will say that um, I feel, you know, when it's your time, it's your time. And I know that some of these positions that I had initially applied for, it was now being in the industry, I know that I had bit off too much more than I can choose. So sometimes, you know, be happy that if they are going through the interview and you don't make the cut, this may be because they're seeing that possibly it may be a bit much for you, right? Uh, that particular position. Um, and that may be that, or you just need some work. Right. And and this is why I'm a huge proponent, or you, Dan, on investing on yourself, investing in education, whether it's, you know, certs or, you know, just small coaching that somebody can actually give you the outside perspective. Um, I had one client who, who he, he just wanted to do one one mock trial interview. And I said, oh, OK, well, usually it's at least two, but OK, go for it. You know, so we had it. And before we started, he's like, you know, I, I feel very confident. I know I execute really well. I just, you know, wanted to make sure because for some reason it's just towards the end, it just doesn't, you know, go forward, you know, mm -hmm. as far as the job. And so when he went through the interview with me, um, I gave him like a long list of things he needed to work on. And he was just like, wow, you know, now that you're mentioning that, I didn't realize that I need, I had those particulars. So sometimes, you know, overconfidence, sometimes very little people, you know, giving you perspective. And so you just need to really... If you're having a hard time, you really need to get out there to those that are in the industry to ask for a handout and say, hey, can you help me? Because I'm having issues. I don't know what's going on. And usually there's a reason, right? So it's all about resourcefulness. Like in this yes. case, your resources are, I mean, yeah, some of these things cost money, but your resources really are like your experience and what you know. And it's how can you, the same, a different person can take the same info and Switch it up. Do a yeah. completely different interview than the other person. So that's that's a skill set right there mm -hmm. in and of itself. Awesome, yeah. Ashley. Well, thank you so much. I mean, I, I know we could always do like two more hours on this, but yeah, <laughs> there's got to be part twos and part yeah. three. And this well, is I'm probably already it. part 20. Yeah, <laughs> part 20. I know we've had a lot of videos. <laughs> thank you. Anything you forgot to mention or you just save it for next time? Uh, I mean... So I guess the last thing would say, like you said, resources. Um, the world is your oyster. Use all things at your disposal. If you do not use it, then you do not, you're not doing everything you can do. I mean, that's mm. just simple as that. When people say, I've done everything I possibly can, I start questioning them on certain things. And they're like, well, no, I didn't do that. Yeah. Okay, then there you go, right? So go through all your resources. If it's a financial issue, go through all the free ones, search I mean, there's so much stuff out there. And if you can, you know, uh, you know, afford to get a coach or something like that, then reach out, whether it's me or to any other coaches that are out there. You know, I don't, you know, as long as you're learning and you're moving forward, that's all that really matters, right? Because mm -hmm. get so many yourself people you in the industry and take care of it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. All right. Catch you later, Guru Nation. Bye. Thank you so much, Ashley. Everybody go uh, click the link in the show notes. Uh, for Ashley's LinkedIn profile, and we'll catch you later. Bye-bye.